it's October 5th, 2023, right here in Lagos, Nigeria. Good morning, good evening, where we're you're watching from. It's Business Morning live on Channels Television. We've got a packed show for you um, today. Ever wondered how some families keep generational wealth? We'll be talking about that uh, and more. But first of all, uh, let's take a look at some um, business news now. Um, economic growth in sub-Saharan Africa is forecast to decelerate this year um, due to slumps in economic powerhouses as Nigeria, South Africa, and Angola. And that's according to the latest report from the World Bank. In its semi-annual outlook for the region, the International Finance Institution explains that rising instability, weak growth in the region's largest economies, climate shocks, and lingering uncertainty in the global economy are causing growth to de decline from 3.6% uh, in 2022 to 2.5% in 2023. However, the World Bank estimates uh, with optimism that um, as Sub-Saharan Africa region would rebound uh, to a projected 3.7% next year and uh, wider 4.1% in 2025. It adds that the region has not recorded positive growth in per capita terms since 2015 due to rapidly increasing population, uh, while overall growth has been inadequate to reduce extreme poverty, um, boost shared prosperity, and create jobs. Let's look at the global oil market now. We'll see oil prices, uh, they're inching up today, clawing back some of the previous session's big losses. After an OPEC Plus panel maintained, oil output cuts uh, would keep um, supply tight, though an uncertain demand outlook um, capped the gains. Uh, Brent crude um, oil futures, that rose 55 cents to $86.36 um, a barrel, while U.S. WTI crude uh, climbed by 55 cents to $84.77. Uh, we see oil uh, settled down more than $5 yesterday as a bleaker a macroeconomic outlook and fuel demand destruction uh, came into focus following a meeting of an OPEC Plus panel um, grouping the organization of petroleum exporting countries and allies that's um, led by Russia. And to the grains market now, Chicago corn lost more ground today while soybeans eased as prices of both crops came under pressure. The most active corn contract on the Chicago Board of Trade, CBOT, CB1, um, gave about 0.1% to $4.85 for the quarter of a bushel. And uh, soybeans, SV1, uh, fell 0.1% to $12.71 for half a bushel. Wheat, um, WV1, that climbed 0.9% to $5.64 for three quarter of a bushel. And to some company news now, Zest Universe, a subsidiary of Stambig IBTC Holdings PLC, is offering uh, customizable e-commerce stores at no charge to its customers. It's according to the chief executive of Zest, Mr. Stanley Jacob, who was speaking at the unveiling of the payment platform in Victoria Island, Lagos. Mr. Jacob gave the assurance that the multi-rail platform will be, a bit, will be able to collect payment in any form that the customer desires. Take a listen. Zest Universe 1.0 comes alive with the unveiling of its new payment platform that will connect consumers and business owners, which will enable multiple options for payment and other value-added services. For better understanding of the payment platform, owners of Zest, a fintech subsidiary of Stambic IBTC Holdings PLC, Converge on the co-hotel and suites to reel out the services Zest Universe 1.0 can offer. Without a fintech, orchestrating platforms could help in generating the next growth uh, coming to, to the financial services sector uh, for businesses, for uh, consumers, for technology uh, developers and we thought that we with our integrated financial services we are probably one of those in the best position to exploit a fintech for the benefit of the society we serve the e-commerce platform is an all-in-one gateway cards qr codes and account-based payments that enables over 40 country currencies zest is focused on delivering a true platform orchestration strategy. There is one thing to be a modular producer within an ecosystem. There is another thing for you to be an orchestrator of a platform. That platform will enable multiple payment options 
in the hands of our esteemed customers. That platform will help businesses collect payments seamlessly. Zest also offers a center of convergence for all sellers, where a new network of customers can easily be reached. We have built a seamless experience for businesses at every stage of their engagement. From the point of onboarding, we ensure that within just three minutes, you are onboarded on our platforms as a business. The company says this marks the beginning of an incredible journey, which should see it attaining market leadership, driving innovation, and setting new standards for payment. And to our first conversation now, studies reveal the family businesses contribute significantly to global um, GDP and job creation. We see leading wealth man management uh, company Mary Stem Securities Limited has launched its family office, a subsidiary called Mary Stem Family Office. Uh, let's find out how the family office uh, works. Joining me now is CEO of uh, Mary Stem Family Office, as was uh, Omar Kamal a subsidiary of Maristem um, Securities Limited. She's joining me right here in the studio, and she's going to teach me and um, everyone how to maintain generational wealth. I know, I, I feel like that must be a very difficult um, concept at this time with all the macroeconomic headwinds everyone's going through right now, cost of living crisis, we're seeing inflation at all-time highs, currency devaluation, yes. all of that. Yes. And I'm wondering how, how do you transfer generational wealth at a time like this. And first of all, but tell me, this is the first of its kind mm -hmm. in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Tell me why, why did Mary Stem decide to do this? So thank you so much, Ladi, for having me here. It's such a pleasure, I tell you. Um, Mary Stem uh, uh, has been working on the concept for two years now. And I am, if you know Mary Stem, uh, a bit the history of it we've been in uh, operation for over two decades and you know we really believe the values that we talk about that is we are completely customer centric and our whole emphasis is on actually growing with the customer so but if you look at the history of mary stem it started with you know stock broking then we added you know wealth we added registrar we added trust so we are looking at different paths of creating wealth that was our history. So two years ago, um, actually, I was talking to uh, the MD, Walia Bengude. Uh, you know, he's such a visionary. You know, actually, I was, I was there to help uh, the senior staff, the client-facing staff, talk to their business people, but about the family. And we said, actually, the, the, the thing that really is missing at Meristem is the bit that will help all this wealth created has to be then passed on smoothly. So we came up with the idea of having a family office service that's a multi-family multi office. So it, it shares it amongst uh, the wealthy family. So if, if you're not Mr. Dangote and you, <laughs> you can't have, uh, afford to have your own, you know, you, you, you come to us. But the purpose of it, and we complement the services of rest of Meristem, it's the first in the country um, and we are the first in the country to have the family office services. But we really believe that that is what is missing in, in terms of actually helping uh, Nigerians actually preserve their wealth and then to be able to pass it on, but pass it on smoothly to the next generation. And why is this so important? Because if you look around the world, right, as you rightly pointed out, most of the money creation, job creation, wealth creation is in family business hands. I mean, look around you. There are very few people who are lifted and go to the capital market, even in, in developed countries, right? I mean, if you think about some of the biggest family-owned companies, Walmart, do you think they are family-owned? But they are family-owned. So the controlling interest is, is a family. So actually, they move the needle the world over. And it's the same in Nigeria. So we have to move and catch up with you know, the rest of the world. And, and that is my mission, to actually support Mary Stem in really helping you know, the Nigerian economy do even better than it can. Because we don't want a break between the first generation and the next. And uh, definitely, um, generational wealth uh, preservation is, is, uh, is a long-term 
thing, you know, at, at this time. So uh, tell me, um, what's your, the, the family office approach to, you know, preserving, you know, generational wealth? So we always start with the matriarch or the patriarch of the family, right? And typically our conversations, you know, before, it, before uh, the family office started was to do with the business. But now we go and talk to them and say, you know, you've made all your money, right? Uh, let's think about what's the purpose? What is the purpose behind making all this money? Yeah? Uh, and, and it's a conversation. And, and it's an encouragement to think about, why have I made all of this? And in thinking that, we include the family. And, you know, the, if it's the matriarch, the, the father is very important. If it's the patriarch, the wife is really important and and we make it a point to have the conversation with the two because what we are trying to do is to avoid the break in the family relationship because if you look anywhere i mean and and this this is the stories are strewn all over right the, that when the patriarch or matriarch dies and without a proper will, let's say, uh, or a plan, or even a letter of wishes, um, then, then the, the, the children and all the beneficiaries start to have a fight. And it's public. And it's, it's really damaging. It destroys the wealth. It destroys relationships. So our job is to actually have that conversation before you know, the family kind of breaks up. And, and we want that there is no feud. So that, you know, people think about it, think about it, you know, that, you know, this money, the, the next generation have a responsibility. So it's not just enjoy the fruits of your right. dad. Be because growing, <laughs> growing up, you know, yes. there were some brands, you know, I knew growing up and they were really good brands. Yes. They, the, the products were amazing. But once the owner died, yeah. it, it, it's most like the, the business actually died. died. It does. And, you know, the statistic is actually really stark. It's less than 30% of businesses that are running and successful today will make it to the next generation. Can you imagine? So that means 70% go bust. Why? Because things are not in place for the next gen. Now you may say to me, and, and it happens very often, that the next gen will say, I have no interest in the family's business because I have my own interest. I want to do something else. And this is the cause of some of the biggest fights between the parents and the children, because the children, you know, they are their own people. But there are very nice ways of, of having a conversation with everybody around, because what aligns the family is actually the family's values. So we, again, have a conversation and we facilitate discussions around what are the family's values. So you've made the money. How do you want to use the money? And you know, actually, if you go back, and you, you go back enough, you'll be able to discover why, why, what is the motivation for people to actually make that money, and then and how do they want to pass it on. So then if the child is not interested in the family's business, there are other ways. They might have other ideas. So what you could do is to you know, extract value from the existing business, but create a pot. Uh, that you then use to for the next generation and also for good causes that you want again your values in terms of how do you want to give back and everybody you know likes to give back in some way or the other but rather than buy that truck and give it three times because it gets lost every year you think about a program of giving and you think and again we are set up to support foundations so we want to help next gen but we also want to help the family leave a legacy. Right. So, yeah. Talk to That's me now about you know um, which generation is at more risk of failing. You know when it comes to transfer of wealth. Mm -hmm. I I don't think um, I don't think you know so the the youngsters the next gen all the ones I work with they are they all have their heads screwed on really straight um, and. Their experiences are very different from their parents. Of course, the parents <laughs> have sent them wherever they are to go and study, right? And so, of course, they are influenced by other things. But at the heart of it, if you have the right conversation, and I keep coming back to this, to have the right conversation with them, they understand. And, and, and they, might, they will support 
and in their way they will contribute. So I don't think that there is a failure in the next generation at all. In right. fact, you look around, some of the best ideas, new ideas, they are bringing it, you know, the technology, the AI, the in pharmaceuticals, chemicals. I mean, take any sector and you'll find the next gen are there. And, and they want to make a mark too. And it's in fact, sometimes having a lot of wealth is a bit of a curse because you don't have your own motivation to get up in the morning to do something. You know, if, if the, the, the bank of mom and dad is giving you every day, it's difficult. But then that's right. when you have the conversation about your responsibility. And so I think it's, it behoves the, the parent to actually, you know, include and in, you know, encourage the youngsters. Right. And also, there are ways that you prepare the next gen uh, for their responsibility. And I want to take a little time because uh, it's really important. So yes, they get education and they are educated abroad, but they need to have experience either in your own sector, whatever sector you want, or in another sector, but just in a business setting. And, and long enough to be able to see what is good, what is not good, uh, look at the world, you know, do different things. Right. But also there are courses, and we are partnering with a few people, you know, um, courses at places like INSEAD or like Columbia in, in, in New York and in Singapore. So, you know, they can go to, you know, courses, you know, short courses that will help them you know, align a bit more, you know, to take on responsibilities. Right. But also give a network of other next gen. So, you know, you go to these courses, you meet other next gen, because you learn a lot from other people in the same situation. So we find that's been really useful as well. Quite, and I definitely have heard it, it's hard, you know, making money, but even harder, mm -hmm. you know, keeping it. Talk to me about um, um, how you tailor your services, mm -hmm. you know, to meet the unique needs of your yes. clients. You know, Meristem prides itself in really being completely customer-centric. And, you know, a lot of places I've been at, you know, will say something about their mission and vision. You know, for us, Meristem, we say when our customer smiles is when we smile. So, you know, that is the, that's the only thing that drives. And we all have, you know, we may say targets, but that's it. Our, our customer's well-being is, is our target. So we really focus on that. So how do we in, in family office translate that? How we do it is by actually, we start with actually preparing dossiers for each of the families that we talk to. And by dossiers, I mean it's not a secret <laughs> dossier, but it's more about getting you know, what, what the public sentiment is, what the holdings are in a public way, uh, where do they get involved with? What are the families involved in? What are the sort of things that... So we build a picture. Before we meet somebody, we have built a picture. Even though they may be clients of ours, but we know them as, you know, one part of it. Let's say they are stockbroking clients, or they are wealth management clients, or they are already clients of our registrar and, uh, and trustees. So we build a profile first. So we understand. We understand, okay, who are the people who they work with. Then we talk to the relationship managers who are already dealing with them to get a feel for the person. Then when we go to the meeting, we put all that aside and we, we have that discussion. So it's a matter of building trust with that person and hopefully the wife or husband is there. And we sometimes encourage them to have their children as well. But really to understand the motivation of that person. You know, why is it that they are spending that time with us? So what is important to you? So that's how we build up a picture, we tailor, our services, and, and by that I mean we really have to understand, which is why this is not for, you know, we are not opening it for hundreds of clients. My target, if I get five clients that I can understand and serve, I am very happy, and we are very happy. With Fantastic. Yes. And, and talking about, you know, families you serve, what, what should a family look out for before, you know, considering, you know, a, a, a management company to manage that wealth and preserve it for them? What do they look out for? Well, they should look at someone where they think that uh, they will be best, their interests, not just the business interests, their family's interests will be best served. So what do I mean by that? It is that the brand is trustworthy, right? So I would say we are a very trustworthy brand uh, and, and having established ourselves as long as we have. And then we have, in the umbrella of Meristem, some of the best companies that you, can help you. So we have wealth management, we have registrars and probate, we have trust services, we have stockbroking. 
all of these services which can help you manage the money. And let's say you don't have some of the things that you need, like tax advice, for example. We are partnering with the best in the business, both here and globally. So the global one is going to be rolled out by next year. But we already have our sights on where we are going with that. And then we can partner. We are partnering with the key people in, the, in, in Nigeria already, where we can have the, bring in the right people for the family. So our focus is completely on looking at the owner, the owner's wealth, and the family that needs to benefit from it. And then we put in place, so what does the family office do? We will put in place the governance that the family needs to be able to manage, you know, navigate through this. And we will support the process, and that's our job. And we will make sure that the right uh, partners are brought in, or the others from Meristem are brought in. So it's our job to make the transition smooth within the firm or with other partners. Right. And then to help the discussion between the, between the members of the family and support the conversation. So that's why how we do it. We tailor it to Fantastic. But, but before I let you go now, just you know, talk to me in a few you know, seconds. How do you transform the fate of a family that has been transferring and preserving poverty from generation to generation? <laughs> talk to me about that. <laughs> Well, you know, I would interpret it as a poverty of values. So you have money, but you, have, you, you don't have the values. So that's what you're transferring. Because really, uh, it's about, if you think about it, people who have a lot of wealth, and, and they have made a lot of wealth, they can also be incredibly poor. Right. Uh, because they haven't thought about uh, their, their values. And, and they, they stray a bit. You know, so, and that's where the problem occurs. So I think our job is to remind them to go back. And so I interpret your words as right. being the poverty of thought and action, which actually, actually, at the end of the day, is probably more important than the real money. Fantastic. So you don't go around <laughs> preserving poverty. Thank you so much. You're it was welcome. great having you for this uh, conversation. Nadi, Umar Kimal, anytime. CEO, Meristem Family Office. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much uh, for Thank having you. me. According to the Nigeria Communications Commission, 2G continues to be the dominant technology in Nigeria's mobile market with 60.32% of the country's 220.36 million mobile subscriptions on the 2G network as of August 2023 compared to 58.36% uh, in May 2023. Another report shows Nigeria is the third least affordable country in the world to purchase an iPhone 15. A Nigerian citizen needs to spend 65% of their yearly salary to purchase the base model iPhone 128 gig. And uh, same goes for other gadgets like laptops, tablets, and uh, et cetera. Joining me now uh, for this conversation is Bankole Bada, CEO um, Hantella. Great to have you on the show. Good morning. Good morning. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So looking at that report by the NCC, that's a huge population that's still on 2G, you know, enabled phones. So uh, break it down for me. What can a 2G um, phone do? Well, I will say that um, due to the economic situation of the country, um, that's um, declining purchasing power, and uh, our minimum wage issues we've been having, uh, customers have been forced to reduce their spend on discretionary income. And um, in this kind of economic situation that we have, first things to go are things that are not important. You know, we have the Maslow's hierarchy of needs that, uh, hierarchy of needs that says food, clothing, and shelter. Up above that hierarchy, we have uh, needs like, um, needs like self-actualization. For people, when there is this economic downturn, they need to reduce they are spent on. So you rather eat than you know buy that. Um, yes, please. Yes, please. iPhone or that 5G enabled phone. Yes, please. Yes, please. So what they do is that um, they go to, they come to us. We are the sellers, and they tell us that at the moment I have so so and so budget, and I need to reduce it so that my salary will be able to fit my spending. What can I do? So we tell them that okay, if you be using an iOS device, you can let's say downgrade 
to like an Android device. If you'll be using an Android device, you can downgrade to a future phone where the, some of the future phones might still give you the, I would say, quote unquote, the luxury to maybe do WhatsApp, but you can't do so much with that future phone or like maybe the Android or the iOS device. Right, yeah. and, and definitely, you know, with the whole drive for financial inclusion, you know, most of these fintech apps, they, they, they need to be used on, you know, phones that can do much more. So uh, definitely this should be some kind of, you know, spanning the wheel, you know, for financial inclusion, because what can you really do with that 2G enabled phone? Well, I will say that um, this trend didn't just start today. Right. We've been seeing this decline since, I would say, um, 2015. But in the last two to three years, the trend now became evident that there is less money in the economy, and an average customer or consumer will say that, well, this phone I have might not necessarily be able to download um, the new apps you have, financial apps, financial institutional apps, like I said, to, you know, to make bank transactions, like send money, receive money, and check balance. But the financial institution, too, they were also wise enough to project this kind of scenario. Hence, the launch of the USSD banking, which was released, um, let's say, like, like 10 years ago, and we timed the adoption of that technology has increased over the years. Because, for instance, um, people that stay in um, remote areas where they don't have maybe cellular network and they don't have the luxury of fast internet, because you, we all know that if you make a bank transaction and the internet breaks, that might result to maybe your money not being received by the recipient and all those kind of bank issues back and front. So hence, the USSD code, which was launched many years back, has been able to bridge that gap and solve that challenge for bank customers. Right, and, and um, I'll tell the truth, you know, I, I, can, I cannot imagine myself right now um, taking a whole sum of two million naira or one point something million to go buy one of these, you know, iPhones. I do not, is there some kind of payment plan you know, what, what kind of discussions are you guys having around this? Because I don't know who, who's going to, you know, take all of that money and go buy a phone. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, I, I can say that um, uh, a few weeks ago, another iPhone was released to the market. And the base model of that phone cost about $800. $800. If we use the benchmark of a thousand naira to a dollar, um, when you purchase that phone in the U.S., you pay tax. When you pay tax, you, you, you also pay shipping costs and clearing here to Lagos, Nigeria. So I just said, that, okay, um, the, the newest base model of an iPhone will land at 900,000 Naira. Looking at uh, the situation of the country right now, yes. uh, if we go by the data of, of, of 65% of a household income will be used to purchase just the latest model of that phone, yes. That is, we are using the benchmark of, uh, of a household that ends approximately between 100 and 120,000. So I would say that um, that's, um, that new iPhone that was launched in Nigeria, well, some people can afford to buy it. A lot of people, especially if you like to be on the cutting edge of technology, where you're like, uh, okay, there's a there's a new release of this phone. I don't want to be left out. I also want to be in the cutting edge. You can afford it. But uh, at the moment, in a, a few years ago, we now have companies that, that do this buy now, pay later, where if you, don't have, um, if you don't have the complete funds to purchase that product, you can approach them and say, hey, I want to, I need a, I need a, I, I need a finance loan to purchase this device. Right. And, they, and, they, and, they, and they're going to take your data and access um, your credit history, and if you qualify, you will be granted. The interest rate varies um, by... Oh, I hope I the interest rate is not up to 50%. No, 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 no. <laughs> because it, I'm not, not going to do that. that. It's not up to that. But another thing... They're they affordable. Do, yes, yes. But another thing those companies do is that you wouldn't, just, you wouldn't just work at them with zero down payment. They will tell you to pay, it varies. Some tell you 50%, 30%, then after you pay that 
initial down payment, you can now spread the payment across um, three to six months to one month, depending right. on... All right, talk to me. You know, I, I, I did see that, you know, most of the gadgets we have, you know, in this country, they're mostly, they're all imported, you know, at this time. What kind of conversations are you guys having, you know, so we can start producing, you know, some of these phones, because we all need these phones. What kind of conversations are being had about that at this time? You know, even if it's some kind of assembly, you know, um, 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 deal. When they come here, you know, they're able to set up something here, assemble the phones here, so that we don't have to pay too much, you know, bringing it in. Yes, yes, you can see that again, because um, um, the, the pressure of importing these devices is putting so much pressure on, the, on Nigerians uh, foreign reserve and, and the demand for dollar. And, and we all know in basic e e economics that when demand rises, price to rises. Um, you mentioned production. I wouldn't say production of all those phones. I would say, I would say let's start with assembling. Uh -huh. Assembling right. first. Because um, a bulk of those um, chips, screens, and other components, batteries that they used to um, um, produce those smartphones, we cannot produce them here. Right. They are all imported from abroad. So all we can do is that we can now, um, we can now approach these manufacturers and say, hey, Nigeria is a very huge market. We have, uh, we have a population of 200 to 220 million, depending on where you're getting your statistics from. Exactly. Yeah, there's a very huge market here. And, uh, and every day, there are so many people need smartphones to maybe work, school, play, or do all manner of things, you know, just to expand their crafts. And, uh, and increase the awareness to, to a whole global audience, as the case may be. So I will say that um, um, I'm, trying to be, I'm trying to be very, very hopeful for Nigeria because right. I believe in this nation so much. I Nigeria, do. Nigeria I, do. I, do I do believe. But in a few seconds now, tell me about the value chain, you know, this mobile industry. How are you guys you know, making it um, uh, be able to generate employment? You know, for the, for the masses here. Okay, yes. Uh, I'm talking about em employment. Nigeria has a young population of of 70 percent below the age of 30, which is very very huge. And uh, a couple of months ago, we used to be the highest. We used to have the highest unemployment numbers in Nigeria, but the National Bureau of Statistics had to change our parameters and said, "Oh, we are no more the highest. We have now reduced <laughs> the numbers, right. which is best known to them." So at Ontela, we started an initiative called the Ontela Campus Rep where students on campus will pay 30,000 naira. That was about 10 years ago, but now we now charge 50,000 naira based on the cost of those accessories that we give to those students on campus at very, very cheap prices so that they can resell and make a margin. And that's, uh, I would say that that program has been a very huge success because uh, we, 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 had, we had like tons of students which we, which we joined the program. We started Unilag, extended it to all campuses around the nation. And at the moment, the latest one we have is not just, uh, is not just for students. If you are a core member, intending core member, in between jobs, you can also join the program, get right. these accessories cheap, and resell and make a profit. Instead of just fiddling with your phones all day and just right. using If I'm going to spend two million on the phone. That phone has to make me a lot of money. Yes. Thank yes, you so yes. much. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank uh, you Bangle, very much. See you on Tele. It was great having this conversation. Thank you Thank very you much. Thank you so much. All right. We'll take a quick moment now. I have to come back. Commodities Market Update is next. Still a lot of volatility in the global oil market. We're seeing prices recover today, but yesterday we've had a big up drop in the market. Joining me now for this conversation is Adisola Simone, senior, fina uh, senior analyst, financial directives company. Um, Adisola, great to have you. Morning. Good morning, Ladi. Thank you for having me on the show. So, Adisola, I'm seeing a lot happening in this oil market, and um, definitely the, the Saudi prince did say um, when uh, oil was reaching or nearing about $60 per barrel, he did say that shorters will be ouching in this market. We saw Brent get, it, it did get to $95 per barrel, but there was all that talk about $100 oil, but it looks like that's off the books at this time. What are you seeing? Indeed, indeed, lad. Thank you for your question. Like you mentioned, um, the global oil market is very volatile at the moment. Last week, we saw oil flirting with 
uh, $100 a barrel, and even Goldman Sachs and some other analysts were forecasting $150 per barrel. And only yesterday, we saw it uh, decline quite sharply by the largest decline in a day, $5 per barrel, $5 per barrel for, for Brent, or around 5.6%, mainly due to you know uh, um, expectations or concerns about demand growth. We saw weak U.S. Man um, services data uh, um, earlier this week. We also saw, you know, um, comments from the U.S. Fed Chair Jay Powell saying that, you know, they are they are likely to keep they are likely to keep uh, interest rates higher for longer. And this, you know, created uh, concerns about economic growth globally, about uh, cost of credit one, economic growth, and then the impact of that on uh, um, oil demand growth. We also saw the dollar strength into nine months high, which you know, um, uh, what's the word? A big made uh, the uh, dollar denominated uh, commodities like oil more expensive to holders of other currencies. We also seen a sharp build up in gasoline stockpiles in the U.S. Uh, data from Energy Information Administration showed that gasoline stockpiles uh, last week we, we saw a surprise build up by around 6.8 million barrels compared to the week before, where we saw a, a, a slight buildup of just a million barrels in a day. So those are some of the factors that are affecting oil at the moment. But on the supply side, like you mentioned uh, in the meeting by OPEC Plus yesterday, they, they, they agreed to keep uh, the production uh, arrangements, the production cut arrangements on up until the end of the year. We also see, in addition to that, we have seen Saudi Arabia also uh, uh, maintain their voluntary uh, production cut of around 1 million uh, barrels a day, as well as Russia. So even though we know prices are still volatile, I think OPEC is trying to keep the market tight with, with uh, this their production cut and the additional voluntary production cuts by Saudi Arabia and Russia. And I think because of, I think even though we see some volatility, we see some technical trading and some shorting, I think prices will still likely remain um, elevated uh, in the near term. Yeah, Desla, what would you say is the best uh, trading strategy now? Is it time for the shorters uh, to come and shine in this market? The thing with shorting now in the volatile market is while there's big opportunities for for rewards, you know, to make a quick buck, there's also big opportunities for for risk. And because you know Saudi Arabia is you know de facto leader of OPEC, they they, they have such rooms to such room to you know um, drive the market. They could review the market again in December and say, you know what, I think we are going to increase our voluntary our voluntary uh, 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 production cut by around two million barrels in a day. And that's you know you know that would further tighten. Uh, 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 at the market. All right, talk to me about the global grains market. Now we're seeing wheat prices, you know, rising, but other grains are, are kind of dropping. What's driving sentiment at this time? Um, I'll say in economics, we say something about market power, which is simply the ability of a firm to, or an, or an, or an economic agent to affect prices. Um, in the wheat market at the moment, uh, Russia is a market power, is a market leader and they have significant market power and what we are seeing is a bountiful harvest coming out of russia in addition to to plentiful stockpiles and russia also is exporting a uh, big volumes and that is kind of depressing depressing uh, uh, uh wheat prices globally at the same time we are seeing attacks on uh, green infrastructure in Ukraine. So while Ukraine is is losing um, ex is, is is losing exports, is not able to export um, as much as they can. Russia is pretty much flooding the market. Now, in addition to that, there are rumors that Russia is trying to impose um, a price. Uh, what's the word now? A price floor, which essentially is uh, selling selling uh, with a higher than the market price. And uh, although it is, it is rumored, and obviously Russia is not going to confirm this, but uh, there are rumors that Russia is trying to set a price flow because of the farmers in the country are, are complaining that their incomes are being eroded due to the low uh, price of grains globally. But I think it is also positive in the sense that um, compared to around this time last year, prices have declined by around 50% uh, per bushel for for wheat, but also in terms of inflation uh, in, in developed countries as well as in developing countries, is positive because wheat is such is, is a big portion is a big component of 
at the food basket so it is positive for the fight for inflation and the you know interest rate cycle it is also positive for uh, food security because many developing countries are uh, imports uh, wheat from from russia or from the global commodities market and with the prices are uh, nearing uh, uh the price is 50 percent low compared to this time last year i think overall it is positive right yeah seeing those grain prices come down does play into the inflation story helping us um drive that down because food inflation is really high um right now here in nigeria but thank you so much uh desola simoni senior uh, analyst financial derivatives company always great having your perspective thank you thank you for having me all right let's head to the local markets now and any john McCarr has all the details great to have you um any i yeah, see hi, red morning, on Gladys. the board good morning yeah so um yesterday was not a very good day for the equities market in nigeria i guess uh, all the uh, financial market or the money market the bonds are sapping all the money at this time right so see, risk uh, off <laughs> so we see it down right there the ngx yesterday closed in the negative 0.43 percent and the equities cap uh, right there, we see down 158 billion. That's how much uh, the equities cap lost. All share index yet to date is now down more than 29%, almost 28%. So uh, let's see the counters right there. Okay, there, the activity volume, volume up almost, um, well, 80% loss. Value also positive, but deals. It was actually a green activity chart, but you know, this doesn't really tell us the sentiments in the market because all it does is to measure the volume of activity. The activity is right there. It doesn't say if it's profit taking or bargain hunting. We see yesterday was dominated mostly by profit taking. And uh, we we'll, uh, we'll also see that uh, 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 stocks such as uh, some of the banking GT Co that did very well the day before, we saw it lost yesterday. Uh, it was the most traded by volume. Traded at um, almost 300, and then we see it right there. May I have that again, the, 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 the sectors? Thank you so much. And then, of course, we see consumer goods was in the positive, industrial goods was marginally down, and once again, we see oil and gas is unchanged. Uh, you know, this is really beginning to catch a lot of attention. Why a whole oil and gas sector in an oil producing country would be unchanged? Now, let's go to the next and see right there. I wonder if we have a guest on at this time. Okay, all right. I hope we can get him before, because we really need to talk about that oil and gas. Uh, so it's important to say that the most traded stock by volume yesterday was uh, universal insurance. You know, insurance catching the attention of, of uh, investors these days. GTCO was the most traded by value. And now looking at the sectors, we saw all of that. Market breath yesterday, uh, 29 tickets gained. 22 losers, so it was a positive one, but the market was, however, down. Now, let's look at the fixed income market. We see the federal government bonds yesterday had uh, brought in about 34.72 uh, 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 billion naira. And we see the securities of interest, you know, this is now the long term one. Bonds are doing very well internationally, UK, US. Uh, right now, we see the NGX uh, stock market suffering for that. So we see uh, that it was a long-term security. Let's see the next one after the federal government bonds. Yes, uh, the open markets are not so active yesterday. Just three deals worth almost 24 billion naira. And uh, let's see the treasury bill. There you have it, 14 deals right there. So um, liquidity, of course, is still a thing right here. We had fact last week that, of course, prompted the market just a little bit, but not a long-term thing. And I just wonder, uh, Ladi, you know, the, the, the government from the budget of 2023 had said it would get most of its funding from this market. I don't think they've done that yet. Right. We, we haven't really felt that uh, much activity. Exactly. Although there was a federal government saving bonds that was opened uh, yesterday. You know, but I, I guess... So I, know the, I, I guess the government right now will be looking for oversubscriptions, but we're, we're not getting that, you know, at this yeah. moment. But definitely still a lot of liquidity issues that, you know, clients and investors have to deal with at this time. But at some point, we're seeing in the global market space, bonds are looking bonds quite Bonds are good. looking really good to the detriment 
of stocks. Of stocks. <laughs> Risk off. Thank you so much. All right, um, thank and, you. All right, let's take a look at what's happening um, in the UK now. We have our correspondent there, um, Juliana, joining us. Um, great to have you, Juliana. So it's all about anti-competition right there in the UK. Uh, we see the regulator been tasked with investigating Microsoft and Amazon's dominance of the cloud computing uh, market. What are you hearing about this? Good morning, Laddie. That's absolutely right. Can you believe the cloud um, service industry is actually worth um, 10 billion US dollars? And of course, it is fast evolving and uh, there are so many players within the market, but there are concerns from Ofcom, which is the telecoms regulator in the UK, about the dominance of Microsoft and Amazon. They released a statement this morning, uh, basically quoting what you said, that they're asking the Competition and Markets Authority to look into practices of Microsoft um, and um, Amazon to see whether or not they are stifling competition. I think they uh, conducted their own in-house probe for about six months speaking to consumers. And there are concerns, namely the fact that if a consumer wants to switch to another provider, it is very difficult for them and it costs. So they've tasked the CMA uh, to look into exactly what is happening. And I think this is part of a much wider picture about how Ofcom and the Competition and Markets Authority look at big tech. We know that since uh, the COVID lockdowns, uh, big tech companies have come under scrutiny, not just from regulators here in the UK, but across um, the EU and in America too. There was a new digital services bill which was introduced at the beginning of the year, which has uh, got uh, the sign off by uh, the British government, basically to look at you know, their practices and to make sure that customers get exactly what they pay for. But also, and I think most importantly about this probe, is that if they do want to change their service provider, that there is an alternative. And I think there is a fear that Microsoft and Amazon are making it particularly hard to do that. So there is going to be um, an in-depth probe, and we're not expecting the conclusion from that until April next year. All right, still a developing story. We'll keep tracking that to see how, uh, what the regulator you know, does next. Thank you so much, um, Juliana. Thank you. All right, let's take a look at what's happening in other markets now. We see Bitcoin uh, found some kind of support there, $27,200. Uh, but we see the sentiment in the market uh, neutral, just like yesterday. So uh, we're still seeing um, investors looking for direction right now. It's not bullish, not bearish, just uh, somewhere right there in the middle. Let's look at the top cryptocurrencies we track now. Uh, we see Bitcoin there, $27,651, uh, 1.03%. And we see XRP. Yeah, XRP, that's uh, one of interest right now, 52 cents. Uh, still above that 50 cent level, 0.32%. Uh, Let's bring in uh, Gilbert, your partner now, financial market analyst. Uh, hello, Gilbert. Great to have you. Good morning. Yeah, hello, good Gilbert. Morning. Great to be here. Fantastic. So we see yeah, the judge in, in the U.S. that has rejected the U.S. SEC's motion to file an appeal against uh, the last court um, ripple victory. While, uh, and I'm wondering, you know, XRP, ripple, they've been in the news for a while now. Is this um, good news for the coin? Okay, XRP case has uh, had its fair share of drama intrigue, and we have paid attention to each details here on the show. You know, we expected a win. It came. We expected an appeal. Uh, it came, and now Judge Torres has denied this uh, appeal. And this is actually a big loss for the SEC. You know, they actually seek to redeem itself from the last headline losses which they had. But this is actually a big win for Ripple and the cryptocurrency uh, industry at large. You know, the, the SEC seeks to regulate through uh, enforcement, which I don't really see as a healthy thing to do. Uh, they even further said, like, all cryptos are security, even though their argument that this isn't. But, uh, you know, even though they still have uh, an opportunity to appeal when this entire case is done in entity, this is still a big win for uh, the SEC and, and, and the cryptocurrency. This is a big win for the cryptocurrency industry, regardless of the outcome. And this is because it will lead more to a kind of more clear regulatory framework for the industry and driving legislative uh, process rather than enforcement. And this actually will boost investors' uh, sentiment and also more like a hallmark and also a morale for other cryptocurrency exchanges and, and, and assets out there that are actually calling for more of a, 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 a legislative process rather than an enforcement. Right. All eyes still on the XRP and the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. But um, looking at the XRP price action now, do you ever see it get back to that high of about $3? 
the high of, it, it, it's very, very possible, and I really think this is going to create even more of a new high when we come into the, the, the bull market. We're going to see a very possibility of seeing more of a double-digit XROP as we move into the bull market, because if this actually becomes a win, this will boost investor sentiment. XRP has a very large army of uh, investors, retail investors as well, who have been in the marketplace, believe as right. well in the technology and the community. So this actually has an ability to sustain price to a new high. All right, we'll keep, watching. Run. we'll keep watching to see if the XRP army actually uh, win this battle. Thank you so much, uh, Gilbert, reporter, financial market analyst. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, so that's how the market is looking today, and that's the show today. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to join us at 1.30 on Business Incorporated for more updates and developments in the world of business. From me and the team right here at Channels HQ, it's bye for now.